This channel has now reached over 50,000 subscribers, and we are all so thankful for the support we've received and the chance to educate and share a passion for the natural world to such a large and ever-growing audience. To celebrate this remarkable milestone, we thought we would make a video looking at what the future of our incredible planet could be like 50,000 years from now. And yes, we have just reached 60,000 subscribers too, which is another incredible milestone that we're very thankful for, so this video is a little bit late. Anyway, we've split this look to the future into three main parts. First, Ollie is going to be examining how the planet's climate could have changed. Next, I'll be seeing how non-human animals and their evolution could be affected in this time, and finally Doug is going to explore what could happen to our own species in 50,000 years. Now, it's important to keep in mind that a lot of this will be speculation, and it's never quite possible to predict with complete accuracy what the future will bring, but we're going to speculate away nevertheless. We'll begin this video by considering the environment and climate of Earth, and remember this is all speculation. As you all know, our climate is changing rather rapidly due to human activities, so in 50,000 years who knows what could happen. There are a number of possibilities as to what anthropogenic climate change may do to our planet, but probably the most obvious and also most devastating is sea level rise. National Geographic released an amazing in-depth map of what the Earth will look like if all the ice melted due to global warming. It is estimated that at humanity's current rate of greenhouse emissions, this would take about 5,000 years to achieve, so 50,000 years is more than enough time for humanity to destroy itself in this way. Assuming this did occur and no other environmental processes interfered, we are looking at most of the world's largest cities going under. Greater Tokyo, which is the world's largest metropolitan area, with around 37 million people, is almost completely submerged, along with Shanghai, the American East Coast, a huge amount of Europe, and the largest city in Africa, Lagos. As you can see, this is obviously devastating to the world, but if this occurs in 50,000 years due to anthropogenic climate change, then many other drastic changes in the environment will occur as well. The melting of permafrost in Arctic tundra will release huge amounts of methane into the atmosphere, helping with global warming, However, not just methane will be released. Many dormant diseases such as the plague and the Spanish flu are buried in the permafrost, but that is more of what will happen to humans, so I'll get back to the environment. Also, if you want to look more at the map, it's linked in the sources. Along with sea level rise that will decimate humanity's largest cities, anthropogenic climate change will also cause massive desertification, the process of deserts expanding. This is already happening right now on Earth in areas like the Sahal region of Africa below the Sahara, so given 50,000 years it's likely that a large amount of the Earth may become desert. So all the ice melting and destroying massive amounts of the coast, and desert swallowing up most of the remaining land leaves humans and other animals little in the way of suitable habitat, meaning society and civilization as we know it would most likely not exist. Think more along the lines of Mad Max. Also, super hurricanes and storms may occur as well as heat waves and flash floods, but this video is too long to get into that. This devastation could very well occur at humanity's current rate of self-destruction, but there is another possibility. What if somehow, against all expectations, humanity managed to come together and solve global warming? Yes, this is one of the more unlikely outcomes, but it's nice to dream, isn't it? Now, there are many ways to do such a thing as reversing anthropogenic climate change. Probably the simplest would be to stop producing greenhouse gases, and given enough time, and hoping at this point we hadn't cut down most of the trees on Earth, most of the CO2 would be reabsorbed into trees, oceans, and other carbon sinks once again, and our atmosphere would balance out, returning the Earth to its normal cycle of climate change, not the massively accelerated climate change that we have caused. Another possibility is carbon capture, where we would capture the CO2 from the air like a plant and turn it back into usable fuel in a loop, instead of putting new carbon into the atmosphere when burning fuel. This method has problems though, as it isn't just CO2 that is causing the enhanced greenhouse effect, it is also methane from livestock and rice farming, and other gases, but it would certainly help. Another solution that is perhaps the most crazy, but also the one I want to see happen because it's so crazy, is building massive reflective satellites in orbit of the Earth that will reflect some of the sun's rays. So assuming we did do one of these methods, and managed to halt anthropogenic climate change, then in 50,000 years our climate would be fine and humans would thrive, right? Well, it's not that simple. There are many other factors that may change our climate in 50,000 years, one of which is ice ages. This era of our climate is probably the hardest to predict, due to how little we know about ice ages, and how little we know about how our actions will affect them. There are many possibilities as to what may happen. 
Anthropogenic climate change may get to the point where a glacial maximum is simply impossible due to global temperatures, however there are some strange effects that global warming may have on the Earth. Global warming leads to increased moisture in the air, which leads to more snowfall, which could potentially increase the albedo effect, the effect of how much of the sun's energy is absorbed by the Earth and how much is reflected back, so a high albedo means most is reflected back, and snow has a high albedo. This would cool the Earth and potentially cause another glacial maxim, as long as global temperatures don't get ridiculously high. So you can see how hard it is to predict what will happen. Add in Milankovic cycles altering the Earth's distance and tilt from the Sun, and potential supervolcanoes such as Yellowstone erupting, and it becomes almost impossible to predict if there will be a glacial maximum in the next 50,000 years or not. Another thing to consider is that in the last 800,000 years, when glaciations have occurred, there has only ever been around 170 to 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the air, whereas now it is thought to be around 400. So the question is whether Milankovic cycles and other processes are enough to change the Earth's temperature anymore. Another interesting climate event that could occur is the previously mentioned supervolcano eruptions. Yellowstone National Park is one of the most beautiful places on Earth, but in 50,000 years it's likely to erupt. If the worst case scenario were to occur and all the magma in its chambers was to erupt, then we would have a problem. Yellowstone has erupted like this three times in its history, the last was 640,000 years ago and the time before that was 1.3 million years ago, so in 50,000 years we are due another eruption. The immediate effect of the eruption would be the death of everyone in the park from either the air reaching 300 degrees Celsius or the pyroclastic flow. Now this is all bad, but so far only the park has been affected. Now comes the world changing consequences of the eruption. Ash of varying thicknesses would coat the entire US and parts of Mexico and Canada. This gets worse if it rains, as wet ash is very dense, so only a few tens of centimetres could cause buildings to collapse. Ash also destroys clean water, electrical grid and infrastructure, but again it gets worse, as at this point only North America has been affected. An eruption of this size could potentially lower global temperatures by quite a few degrees, causing crop failures and famine, and depending on how long it lasted, maybe even a mini glacial period, all completely messing up the Earth's climate. In the end, the Earth could be anything from a hot desert to a frozen wasteland. Our climate is unpredictable and erratic, and that's even without humans interfering, so it's truly unknown what lies in the future of our Earth, and from looking at the possibilities, I'm kind of glad we won't be around to see them. Next, we'll be looking at how other non-human animals might have changed in 50,000 years. Obviously, this is not exactly enough time for significant macroevolutionary changes to have occurred in most animals, but we can still speculate how these future creatures could have adapted their behaviours or small parts of anatomy to better suit whatever the coming years hold. Depending on how long humans manage to last for, it seems likely that some of the most successful animals in the future will be those we currently consider as pests. In After Man, Dougal Dixon suggests that rabbits will eventually fill the niches left by extinct ungulates, such as deer, and rats will evolve to become large predators, as well as developing into other forms, taking on some of the roles performed by carnivorans today. This certainly does seem fairly plausible, given that rodents thrive in human-constructed landscapes such as cities, and rabbits have been spread around the planet by our species, interfering with farming practices and breeding like, uh, rabbits. So how might these organisms change in the next 50,000 years? For the moment, we're going to assume that humans are still somehow around in 50,000 years. In this case, surely the rabbit and rodent populations would grow to ever larger numbers if the human population were also to increase. Expanding cities would provide more habitat for rats and other such rodents, and perhaps slight modifications between generations would make the animals better at detecting food sources for more effective scavenging. Maybe also larger sizes in these creatures could be reached, with even more humans producing even more and more waste that could be accessed. Other animals that have taken residence in city environments may also prove to be the most successful animals in the future, with organisms such as pigeons, gulls, cats, raccoons, squirrels and even some primates, for example rhesus macaques, possibly seeing booms in their populations as their newly acquired concrete habitats expanded further. Average body size increases could additionally be expected for these species, since they'd have more resources to exploit. In the case of the rhesus macaques, larger troops might end up forming in cities, since currently the animals group together in more numbers in urban environments than in their natural habitats. 
Another interesting adaptation to existence alongside humans is the evolution of louder and differently pitched calls in songbirds to allow their vocalisations to be heard over the city noise. This has already been observed in living bird species, as a study on silver eyes living in urban Australia showed, so we could expect surviving songbird species to develop incredibly loud, high-pitched calls. There would also probably be many other species of various organisms that would adapt well to continued human existence far into the future, especially certain invertebrates such as cockroaches and silverfish that are able to thrive in houses. Domesticated animals, such as those kept as pets and those used in agriculture, would also certainly manage to survive under the protection of humanity. On the other hand, it seems to be an upsetting certainty that a lot of species will go extinct in the next few thousand years, and even in the next few centuries and decades, if humans continue to grow and exist in a similar fashion to today. Endangered animals that are now under threat of habitat loss will sadly probably not make it for much longer if the human population continues to grow and requires more land for living and agriculture. Modern amphibians, which are currently undergoing a tragic decrease in biodiversity, could be particularly badly hit, along with the iconic megafauna of Africa, including elephants, rhinos and giraffes. Cetacean species would likely not fare too well either, we've already experienced the almost certain extinction of one family of toothed whales with the death of the last Baiji sometime in the early 2000s. This extinction was the direct result of human activities, and it's very probable that several other whale, dolphin and porpoise species will follow this path too. Thankfully, there are certain cetaceans that are actually recovering from their decimation during the whaling period, such as the largest animal ever, the blue whale, which currently has an increasing population trend. We can only hope that incredible creatures such as this manage to remain alive for as long as possible. And all of these predictions are not even fully considering the effects of anthropogenic climate change. With the drastically altering climate and rising sea levels, it seems even more habitats will end up being lost to the various species that called them home, not helping the survival of organisms already on the edge. A certain possibility could be that at some point in our future, once numerous species of iconic animals from our time have disappeared in the wild, we could have parks filled with these organisms. It could be a sort of Jurassic Park for more recent creatures, containing cloned individuals of the various animal species seemingly doomed to be wiped out from the wild, or the descendants of captive animals in zoos today. Obviously, I hope this is not the eventual destiny for much of the incredible life inhabiting Earth right now, but it could be one way to preserve the memory of these remarkable organisms, and teach future generations about the very real danger of extinction. Another factor to consider when thinking about the possibilities of animal life in a human-dominated future is the effect of genetic modification. Even today, domesticated animals are being selectively bred to improve the yield of meat, or to produce more lean meat, for example the Belgian blue cattle, and there are also certain organisms that have already been genetically modified. Currently, these modifications are primarily to reduce the risks of diseases affecting livestock, although there are examples of animals engineered in different ways, such as modified salmon in Canada that are able to reach sizes they can be sold at in half the time it would usually take. So, we can probably expect genetically engineered animals to become far more common in the future as they become more and more of a normality to us, and even an eventual necessity to feed a larger population. Perhaps, if livestock are actually still being consumed 50,000 years from now, there will be modified creatures akin to the creepy food species in Dixon's Man After Man, where cattle and other domestic animals have been turned into large bulbous mounds of meat that are able to grow at an accelerated rate to provide for the future humans. Let's hope not though, that would be a bit messed up. Of course, everything I've talked about so far is assuming that humans manage to survive on Earth another 50,000 years, and the population continues to grow to a point that can still be sustained, which seems like a relatively unlikely future. The alternative outcome is that humans are no longer around this far into the future, possibly having completely left Earth in search of another planet, or due to our own extinction. Obviously there are far more possibilities than this, but for the purposes of the video, let's assume that humans just disappear in about 200 years. What would a natural world left over from human habitation look like 50,000 years from now? Well, possibly much like the future I've already described. Rodents and other organisms suited to life in cities could still end up being some of the most successful survivors of the age of humanity. 
there would likely be a bit more diversity of life left over too, if certain at-risk and threatened animals managed to make it out alive before they fell prey to the effects of humans and too much of their habitat was taken. So, hopefully there'd still be some giant cetaceans around, maybe even some African megafauna too, and whatever animals were left would be able to continue evolving and reclaiming the environments taken by our species. There'd sadly still probably be a lack of quite a few endangered organisms though, and so the predictions made in After Man might be starting to become a reality in 50,000 years time, with pest species beginning to fill the empty niches left by those animals that were not able to survive the effects of humans. As an example of this sort of thing, perhaps at this time we would be seeing the early stages of the evolution of the Rabux, as Lagomorphs spread into more and more niches and replaced certain ungulate species that may have become extinct. Perhaps too, the giant predatory rats of Afterman, known as the Phalanx, could be in the first stages of their evolution. It does seem unlikely that large felids such as lions, tigers and leopards will be able to survive much longer under the current pressures, and by the time humans have disappeared in this hypothetical future they may not be around any longer. As truly regrettable as this is, it would open up the niches for other groups of organisms to fill, and rodents that have been prospering from life in big cities seem as good a candidate as any to start evolving down this path after the age of humanity. It's also interesting to consider what may happen to the domestic animals of our time once our species departs. In After Man, Dougal Dixon suggests that animals kept as livestock will have grown so dependent on human care that they can simply no longer survive without us, and end up dying out. This could be possible in 200 years, especially if, as previously discussed, genetic modifications make various breeds of livestock incapable of living in natural conditions. However, I'm not so sure every kind of domestic animal will die out. Sure, some of them almost certainly will without the influence of humanity, but animals such as domestic cats seem like they could survive without us, and chickens, which currently outnumber our own species massively, potentially have a high chance of making it another 50,000 years, if only due to the sheer number of them and therefore the large likelihood of some populations managing to find and exploit one niche or another. Now, we would obviously need a lot more time to go into more detail of the possible future outcomes that await non-human life in 50,000 years, and my part of this video only serves as a brief overview of a few entertaining ideas for what could happen. What I've said here is also in absolutely no way certain to occur, which is why I've tried to avoid getting into too much detail since we can never really know what changes future animals might go through. However, I would be very interested to know what you think could happen to animals on Earth 50,000 years from now, so be sure to comment below your ideas for how things could change in this time. Right then, hum No, no, stop that. This isn't... Never mind, let's just get to it. Humanity's future is currently very uncertain, but there's so much that can happen, so much opportunity, and a lot of danger too. This is going to be the wildest one, sorry guys, because it's just so unpredictable with so many fascinating opportunities. Let's start off with the shorter way to go. It is of course entirely possible that in 50,000 years, humanity will no longer exist. The most dramatic and often the most talked about way that we could no longer be here is the lovely possibility of nuclear war. I'm not going to go into the political details, but there are currently enough nukes on the planet to easily wipe out the major cities. If all of humanity's nukes were used, it could plunge Earth into a nuclear winter. Not a particularly nice prospect, because this is where the masses of debris and smoke produced by all-out nuclear war blocks out the sun for potentially years, and we get to experience freezing temperatures and probably all die. Depending on how long it lasts, humanity could survive this though, but rebuilding would be difficult in these circumstances. Another way we could go is the predicted devastating effects of climate change. This again is an often talked about scenario for human extinction, and not without reason. Human activity is dramatically increasing the rate of climate change, and this is called anthropogenic climate change. I won't be going into detail on this one though, Ollie's already done that for you. Alarmingly, those aren't the only ways humanity could end. There are actually loads, and I'm not even going to go through all of them. Overpopulation could also kill us all. The Earth isn't an infinite size, obviously, and its resources and landmass are finite, so eventually something will have to be done or we'll all die. 
In 2017, Stephen Hawking warned that due to the continued rise of human population and the increasing energy needs of the human race, humanity needs to become a fully fledged space faring species in the next 500 years or face extinction. Basically, we haven't got long to get our act together and become a multi planetary species. Which brings me to our next avenue, leaving the death of everything aside. Perhaps one of the most exciting possibilities for future life is the human race going beyond the stars and exploring and colonising the galaxy. It's extremely hard to say where this kind of technology will be in 50,000 years time though, but we can safely say, if all goes well, we could have spread throughout the stars. Einstein's widely used theory of relativity prohibits ordinary matter from even matching the speed of light, meaning that exploring particularly far would mean doing something other than travelling. It gets weird. In order to, well, loophole around relativity, we need to look towards our good old friend quantum physics. In 1994, Miguel Alcubierre created a theory that uses quantum physics to solve the problem of faster than light travel. The theoretical warp drive was called the Alcubierre drive and would effectively use negative energy to warp space around it, making it smaller in front of the craft and larger behind. The specifics of this are obviously a little unknown to us though. For example, the amount of energy from the negative mass needed could be anywhere between the mass of the Voyager 1 spacecraft and the mass of the observable universe. Let's hope it's closer to the former. But what is negative energy? Good question, but perhaps for another time. How would we live on these other planets though? All of the other planets in our solar system are currently inhospitable for an unprotected human. So in order to take full advantage of a planet, we need to make it hospitable for humanity. We need to terraform it. This, at least to start off with our current knowledge, is going to take quite a while. Mars, for example, will probably take hundreds of years to terraform, but that's okay, we've got 50,000. So how would Mars be terraformed? Very quickly and in a nutshell, it would have to be heated up so the Martian ice would melt, to create oceans. If we could artificially sustain plant life there, this could eventually convert the CO2 rich atmosphere into a more oxygenated one. So, as a whole species, if we're still here, we've probably expanded throughout the stars. But what are we like, as humans? It's widely believed that in the future, designer babies will become a thing. This means genetically modifying embryos to have certain character traits later on in life. This is a highly controversial technique, and has allegedly recently been done in China, in order to give a baby the ability to resist HIV. Once this starts happening, it's extremely likely that it will very quickly become a normal practice. So it seems as though this will be our future. Speaking of biology, humans could look very different in the future. There's quite an interesting book on speculative evolution for humanity, called Man After Man, an anthropology of the future. It's kind of post-apocalyptic, and it suggests that in 50,000 years time, Homo sapiens would have split into many different subspecies after experiments with genetic engineering. For example, Homo nanus, islanders who feast almost exclusively on meat, and Homo vates, chimpanzee-like people who have evolved to detect water from long distances. It's really cool, weird, and actually quite fun, so go check it out. There is a more popular theory that humans will evolve into two distinct subspecies, one more ugly and less intelligent, and the other the opposite, super intelligent and attractive. I'm personally going down that second route, but uh, hey, that's just me. There's just so much that could happen in the next 50,000 years. We could be an underground species that can't deal with sunlight, scuttling around tunnels that dart around inside the earth. We could be slaves of an alien race come to exert dominance because of their technological prowess. We could be enslaving an alien race to exert dominance because of our technological prowess. Three people could have found the secret to eternal life, but accidentally wiped out the rest of humanity while they were at it, so now just roam around the universe as gods or not wiped out the rest of humanity and be ruling as benevolent beings of ultimate power. We could have uploaded our consciousnesses to the internet and be roaming around an eternal virtual plane of existence. Or perhaps quantum computers will take off and revolutionise everything. On the other hand, they could just make every digital security system ever, including nuclear codes, completely obsolete. Or they could be a very specialised tool for simulations to boost scientific research. We could also be taken over by a super intelligent rogue AI that learns everything in three seconds flat and decides to wipe out humanity. We could have accidentally merged all of our DNA with spiders and be walking around as spider people. We could have a galactic empire and dominate lesser species. Or we could be part of an... Anyway, we hope you enjoyed this 50,000 subscriber special. Thank you so much. It, it really is a, a brilliant and unbelievable milestone. And this video has been a bit different, but one we all enjoyed making nonetheless. 
Also, we recently received a shout out from a channel called Scholar Gladiatoria, which was a rather kind gesture. We thought we'd try to repay this by mentioning the channel here. So if you're not already subscribed to him, you absolutely should be. Matt makes great videos about military history and they're honestly a joy to watch, so get stuck in. Most of the stuff we've covered today, especially in the final part, is widely speculative. So enjoy speculating yourself and give a few suggestions yourself in the comments to what you think life could be like in 50,000 years. Also, if you enjoyed the music in the video, I certainly did, it was written by our good friends Matt and Tom. To hear more of their stuff, you can subscribe to Matt's channel and follow Tom on SoundCloud. Both links will be down there in the description. If you haven't already and you want to learn more about the wonderful life around you, feel free to subscribe if you think we deserve it. And thank you so much again for 50,000 subscribers.